So, Mr. Scooter, thank you so much for uh, coming to uh, do this little chat with us. Uh, this is going to be, Alex, what podcast number are we on? 41. So this is number 41, and the first uh, podcast we're talking about real estate. Wow. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to have you on uh, from the standpoint of uh, real estate investing. I know you're very active um, in our town. Um, you've done a lot of things when it comes to real estate. I think you'll agree you probably don't know everything, uh, but you've, uh, you've been around a long time. Uh, you're very well respected in our community. And I just want our listeners to be able to see a little bit of what I see over the years of uh, what you've accomplished and um, how you continue to give back to our community. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. All right. So um, let's, I mean, we're not going to go all the way back to birth, but <laughs> tell me a little bit about your background. So uh, big family, right? Yep. Come a family of eight, uh, eight brothers and sisters. Um uh, not, uh, you know, my dad was a truck driver. Mom taught dance uh, at Judy's Dance Studio on Pine Street. Um, so not a whole lot of um, real estate involvement in my, in my growing up. So I don't know what happened with me. So where yeah. do you fall in that eight? You like in the beginning, the end, or you right in the middle? I'm right in the middle. Right yeah, in the middle. Middle kid. No, do, does all your siblings, and most of them live here in town? Uh, well, it's really sad. We, um, we, you know, buried um, a sister. Um, we've, uh, you know, they've moved off and moved back. Um, my brother lives off. Uh, my sisters are here locally in Downsville. Might as well say locally. We've got a sister off. So we're kind of scattered out. Scattered around. Yeah. So I think you had mentioned that um, you were homeschooled. Born and raised in this area, you were homeschooled. Yeah. How was a homeschool life? Uh, well, it's a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, learning on your own, um, you know, uh, trial and error. Uh, it was, uh, I did go, I went to school third grade and then, uh, pulled out for whatever reason, something to do with, you know, they were having us color, uh, something that was Halloween and my mom didn't like it. So no uh, more she's that. like, out. Uh, no more of that. But, um. It, it, you know, I think it taught me a lot of how to do hands on things. You know, like I just said before we started, was you know, I was just in a hole, uh, showing these guys about this whatever pipe that they couldn't figure out. And you know, I'm no plumber, but I can, you know, if we connect these two, then it'll connect to this and it'll all work out. So I think learning hands on was probably the most beneficial thing for homeschooling. Now, you mentioned that your dad was an over-the-road driver, so I would assume that he was gone for a period, then would be home for a small period and gone again. Right. Uh, did you ever get involved with him on uh, projects when, when he's at home? I mean, what did home look like for him when he was at home? For sure. I mean, we um, he was always – he we had a pretty good-sized shop. We would um, – building out back, and we you know, built just about everything, you know, little houses, dog houses. We – um, so I would pick up some things, but never full out construction projects, but, uh, he had always just told me to try it, you know, and let me, let me run off and mess something up and doesn't work he can come back and fix it. Right. So, so is that where you feel like you got your work ethic from? I think so. Um, you know, that from such a young age, just, you know, he, they would leave me to do whatever it was, and I'd just try to get it done, you know. And uh, I think I think so. And seeing my mom work, you know, she was at this dance studio until I was five. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. I wish I'd, I did because I could teach my kids that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not alone. But, you know, I think in today's world we all kind of struggle a little bit to figure out how just to get a kid to make eye contact, you know, right. especially when they get into uh, middle school and they got the devices and right. they just, uh, you can have five kids in one room and none of them's talking to one another. They're texting back and forth. Darnest thing I've ever seen. So sad. Uh, so let's talk about how you got your first uh, endeavor. When did the real estate itch hit you? How did, how did, how did you get connected with um, the desire of wanting to sell real estate? So this guy uh, that still does real estate now, but uh, I was working for his, him, and he was 
we were trashing out houses when we were like barely able to drive and he would have us go it was my buddy's stepdad he'd have us go and trash out houses and then one day we ha- we worked at his house huge four column white mansion looking house which it 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 is still a mansion to this day but it's uh you know pretty obtainable for uh now i would think but um but at back the time, when you were younger what what kind of age range were you when we're, probably 14 15 so uh, from a 14 15 year old kid looking at this massive place like h- how do i get that yeah so he had he had rental property and uh he had a bunch of it and we would we go around trashing them out and you know scooping up stuff the same thing that my people do now for me well, you know um a little side note I've been doing this for 18 years. I don't get to see as much on the trash outside as what you see, but I have seen enough to know if you truly have never seen a trash out, you're missing something. (laughs) But I can't imagine from a 14-year-old, 15-year-old kid going through a trash out and still saying, yep, I still want to do this because, man, there's some people that live nasty. It's bad. And I just... And it's people that do it over and over. I can understand somebody falling into depression and uh, things get overwhelmed. But when they leave this place and go to the next place to do it, yeah, it's uh, I just it's, makes me lose a little hope in humanity when I start right. seeing all that stuff. So let's advance. So you're trashing out houses with him. You're fifteen ish, um, and you're like, I want to learn more about this. So so take me from there. So, um, really it was, you know, he was just saying, he, he kind of mentored me into it later after I got 2018, I, I still contact this guy, but, um, we, uh, you know, we started talking about really, you know, what's it take to buy? How do you do this? And, you know, he just kept telling me, just go do it, just go find something and take it to the bank. And, uh, so I did, I bought my first house with a, um, FHA loan. You know, um, I had no, there, there, no way I should have gotten approved for this loan. I worked at a bicycle shop. I cut down trees. I did, you know, side jobs. I, there's, I did a stated income loan. Okay. That was back in the day where they were <laughs> doing some the, really. I was the reason yeah. uh, for the, the way. To, Tightening the rules uh, up a little bit. Probably. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, they let me get it and, um. I had. It, what did this house cost you? 60, 62. 62. Did you have to do a lot of work to it before you moved in or is it pretty much ready to go? It was pretty much ready to go for what it was. Okay. So yeah. three, two, one, three. Three, one. So three, one, three yeah. bedroom, one bath house. On Natchitoches Street. All right. In, so you, in the Ville. You, you've got, you've got this house purchased and, and what was your, do you remember what your monthly note was on it? Like. 580 with insurance. So 580, <laughs> 580 with insurance. But for someone that was probably working in a bicycle shop, um, doing side jobs, probably was stretching you to figure that 580. So did you have did you have roommates with you or? Oh yeah, that's the only way I was able to make it. Okay, I, I know, no. no uh, you know, my job was, uh, you know, minimal. Right. And, uh, so yeah, definitely roommates. I mean, we would chip in together and pay the light bill. It was, uh, of course I, I was single and, you know, we had a lot of fun, but there was some broke times yeah. and I said, well, you know what? I need another one so I can pay the note on this house so I can get these guys out of my house. So I can have it for myself. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know? Yeah, that uh, roommate lifestyle can only take you so far to where you're like, I need my own space. <laughs> right. I right. need my own space. So how long were you in the first one before you bought your second one? Uh, about a year. So about a year. Now, buying that second one, um, you said FHA loan to get the first one. So that's 3.5% you had to put down. don't know if you had to cover closing costs or a seller covered it for you. But now how did you get pull your money together for the second one? So I didn't have any, any, you know, money to put down on that house for whatever reason. They, 
did it to where I didn't have to. Okay. You know, this is back in the day. I got you. Um, the second one, I did a rural development loan. Okay. And back then, rural development and FHA obviously didn't talk because I was able to do that one. Wow. It ended up costing me. I remember I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to scrape together like 700 bucks. It was like to, to get yeah. whatever, some fee paid and uh, to close on that deal. And uh, that was a struggle, you know, back back then. I, I, I was just hustling and working at a bike shop and cutting trees down and doing all kind of stuff just to make some money. And this house was in very bad condition. But uh, I, I was able to. And you got a rural development on it with the condition I was in. So, no, I didn't. I got a, um, I got a, a loan from a bank, a local bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, Jeremy did. Jeremy Harold did my second house. Okay. Um, I have no idea what he saw. I mean, he was young, too. That's 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, and uh, You're trying to say he's old now. <laughs> no, <I'm not>. <laughs> <laughs> he's older than me. Uh, but uh, you know, I I bought that house with a bank loan, just like I do today, and uh, fix it up, and then we okay. turned it out. But uh, yeah, it was cr- it was crazy. I I was bidding against other people around here. Twenty one years old. Yeah, I was, your second house. Working at a bike bike shop. Still working at um, a bike shop. Still working at a bike shop, cutting trees on the side, just hustling, trying to make it happen. Yeah. Because you saw what could be if you were, you know, if you played your cards right. I mean, you saw what someone else had achieved in that area. Um, right. So I'm assuming that was a path that you were trying to follow. That's right. You know, he had the big house and had people working for him, and he didn't really do a whole lot except come in the house and tell us to pick up stuff. Yeah. And uh, how long did it take you to get that one rehabbed and rented at that point? Well, back then they told me six. I had six months to to redo the loan, mm-hmm. and um, you know, so that's what I thought was the deal. I had to I had to get on it and get it done. So, you know, I got it. I I did every bit of it myself. Me and whatever friends I uh, had. I mean, we put down tile. We tore down walls. We did all kind of stuff. Still have that house today. Was all your tile level and, or was it a little, be careful, you're going to stuff your toe on something. It's been redone since we did it the first time. Okay. So. All right. So we're two houses into it, working at the bicycle shop, cutting trees on the side. At some point you ended up going into uh, the manufactured housing side. So was that the next, the next move or were there things in between that? Um, no, I pretty much started working for, um, Homes Plus doing, selling mobile homes and, and then went to doing the financing for all the, the sales team there. And then, uh, did a little of the service contract part of it. And, uh, and pretty much that was, it was seven year stint of developing. I mean, we would do it from start to finish, you know developed the land, mm-hmm. gave me a lot of construction experience that I didn't know about and development experience. You know, I was, you know, maybe 22, 23, trying and setting up, setting up houses. Sure. I, the the modular homes over on uh, Avent and uh, okay. uh, over by West Lakes. Uh, I set up all the, did all the organization for those construction projects there. Um, that was a uh, like one of my first big, big deals to do there. And that's not a quick process. I would say you're looking anywhere from 60, some case, depending on bad weather, could be up to 90 days getting from start to finish. Had an inexperienced yeah. person trying to put it together, yeah. and he was add a few, <laughs> add a few weeks to it there. But it was fun. But you learned a lot. I learned a whole lot, and it didn't cost me anything. You know, luckily I had a good boss. So during that time, seven years, were you still acquiring properties at that time? I would buy, like, my goal was to buy one a year, but I'd end up, I I bought a package of five. By the time I got done working there, I was, I had uh, gotten about 10 or 11 properties, if I remember right. All right, so 10 or 11 properties, and um, at some point through that process, so you were about seven years um, 
in the mobile home side of the business. Right. You had an opportunity to um, to buy a business. Right. Tell me about that. Man, my um, <clears throat> my aunt owned Powerhouse. So you know Susan mm-hmm. Semino. She was uh, moving to Ruston and gonna shut down the Western Road location. And my sister Jenny worked for her, and my mom and my younger sister Tori. They all worked for her. So she was gonna. I was so. We basically came in and said, hey, you keep it open. We'll just buy it, and we'll hold this location. And uh, I worked at, at uh, Homes Plus and did, you know, we had Powerhouse together. And I did that as a side. And then after we opened another location, uh, I jumped on in full time. How was it leaving that uh – that steady weekly paycheck. Oh man! And um, uh, taking that jump into I'm now a business owner, and I've got to make it work. Definitely uh, was scary. You know, I always thought that I could go back. You know, I was making big money on from my rental, my ten rental property because I had a job and it was just sitting there, you know, making money. And right. at the time, I could live on pennies, so it wasn't you know, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, it was scary that I wouldn't have that extra income of a, of a job, but, um, shoot, man, I got, we got, it was no time I had in no time. I had zero time for myself and we were, we were, that business was full throttle. We had, you know, four locations. We did some offsite locations, just, uh, you guys ended up growing that at one point up to how many locations and service and how many students weekly? We had uh, coming through that the doors of all our facilities every week. So kids come once a week. Uh, we had right at 800 kids wow. coming through there. 800 so, kids. How many locations? Out of four locations. Four locations. Now, West Monroe being the, being the, the biggest, one. right. What did, what did you learn – through that process. I know you're not part of that anymore. Your right. sister bought you out for your locations. What did what did you learn about business in general through running that business? Uh, what are some lessons? <laughs> big lessons. Um, just get the right people. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, we would try people here and there. <clears throat> I mean, we had operations team, you know, it was a, a big, a big business for us back then. Um, but having the right people, I mean, you know, I know it sounds cliche because everybody says it, but having the right people in the right seat on the bus. Yeah. I mean, it's so, so important. You talk to business owners now, it's, uh, uh, desperate for qualified people. Um, anybody, you know, Matt Dickerson has said before that, um, uh, I can go get a warm body. That's not a problem, right. but mm-hmm. I don't need a warm body. I need a I need a warm body that knows how to do this, this, and this really well <laughs> and be a good communicator and, yeah. um, you know, assimilate with everyone else. Right. So um, it's all about people. Yeah. Uh, I think that and um, doing something that you really like to do. We, you know, gymnastics business was not my passion to do. And uh, it was my sister's, which was great. But it's still, you know, that wasn't my thing. My thing's always been real estate since I've been trashing out houses at 14, you know. And I, um, in that, doing that, um, it really afforded us to do, to be able to do a lot of stuff. And one of the things was, you know, I didn't have a job, so I was able to take care of my dad while he was going through his cancer mm-hmm. for a couple of years. And I was able to see firsthand on you know, do the things that you want to do because you don't, you know, Life we're all going to, we're all going to die. Life is short. Yeah. It's coming fast. So when did, what was the deciding factor for you to pull the trigger? Said, look, I, this is taking too much of my time on the things I really want to be able to grow and do. So how did you come to that realization? Um, well, after my dad had passed away, it was, you know, it was just really, 
I had time to think about what was what I wanted to do and, you know, helping facilitate people flipping kids and dealing with, you know, all the employees that ha- that comes with and dealing with all the parents that mm-hmm. that comes with some good, some terrible, you know, dealing with the public in that aspect uh, is is really a lot. And that wasn't my thing. And I didn't want to do it anymore. And I, we pretty much it was within a few months we had all the deal, details ironed out and you know i was i was done with that uh, just on and just did full-time real estate how was it working with family uh it was it was really good we we had you know we all had our part sure of course we had disagreements you know we um but you know who's not gonna have, i have disagreements yeah. with my people now and uh it's just whenever it's with family it's got to be yeah you know, you're gonna see them next week Absolutely. so <laughs> you got to get that one spooked up pretty quick right yeah but so, i do it again what it was the um so you're in real estate you've got 10 or 11 properties by now maybe a couple <clears throat> more since then how yeah. long were you doing powerhouse with your sister uh i believe we were we had that together for six or eight years it uh because I kind of transitioned into it slow, and then I kind of transitioned out into out of it. You know, I started kind of, you know, they take over this, take over this, take over this, and eventually sold out. So when you you sold out, you're you're away from it. You got all the time for you to to whatever you want to do with it to be able to grow. What plan did you have in place that was different from before? Or uh, where was your mind at? I mean, is it like we're empire building, we're going to get as big as we possibly can? Or did you have a very strategic plan of that? I'm only going to do this and I'm going to stay in this one thing. Or are you just like, I just want to get it all. We're just going <laughs> to, we're just going to go out and see what happens. Yeah. I used to tell people I was just working on my empire. I used to tell everybody when they'd ask me, Hey, what are you doing? You know, how's it going? Yeah. Just working on my empire. But, um, you know, I got, really focused on buying single family houses. Okay. Once I found that niche, uh, you know, I knew I could buy them easily. It's just a repeat process. Uh, and I went after it and started buying as many as I could. Uh, I didn't have a limit at the time. You know, I, I'd set a goal. I want to get 60 and then I'll have, I can stop and go to the beach or something. I have enough to buy a beach house. I, you know, I thought I needed 60 houses to buy a beach house, but, uh, turns out you don't, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we buy another one. I'd buy packages of houses and I just kept doing that and adding them to it and, uh, and growing that way. So at some point you decided that I've got to have a system in place for managing my properties and, uh, you created a management company, um, uh, and to me, it, it only made sense, like it was a natural step. If I'm already having people employed to handle my business, why not spread the cost out and offer the service to someone else? So tell me about how you got that started and where that led you. Man, yeah, that was a um, – starting a property management company was the natural progression. You know, I had been asked, and I would help some people here and there uh, as far as managing it full-time – but um, I had a manager that uh, she somebody approached her with wanting to to do that and um, wanting to manage somebody else's, you know, in our same office. And I was like, well, why don't we just start, you know, a whole management company? Well, for people who may not understand what a management company actually does, give us like a, an overview of what a property management company actually does for uh, an investor. Well, for for us, we would take care of. We would just, you had a house, a spare house that you inherited or bought, or, you know, if you're an investor, we would um, And I didn't want to really do anything with it. I just need somebody to handle it for me. I just want to get a check. We'd get you a check. And that's, uh, we'd, we'd rehab it. we deal with the insurance company. we deal with, you know, all the tenants, and we just send you a check the next. And one of the main benefits to an investor, property owner, is that, um, not only are they getting their time back because you're handling this, 
in theory, they should be saving money when it comes to repairs because you're not having to call the name brand people out for every little thing that goes on. You've got a crew most of the time right. or a, a contract with a company that handles multiple things. So ultimately, the cost should be cheaper. Yeah, sometimes it is. Um, you know, it is a it is a very hard business. I see people go into this business all the time, and uh, I applaud them for doing it. But it is, you know, you you're right. You're not going to call the plumbing warehouse to to fix a uh, every leaky faucet. But sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to call them out. But for sure, if you look at it on an average, if it's run correctly, that management company should be saving you money over the long term. For it. sure. Definitely time, but also oh, yeah. money at the same time. I agree. But I could see some challenge of owning a company like that coming back to people again. Right. Um, having people on the right seat of the bus. Uh, I know just in my real estate business, it is extremely hard to find somebody that will do quality work at an affordable price and it be a small job. It's yeah. just, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, business owners that are in the construction – they don't make much money. A lot of times it costs them money to go out and do a small job because of having to sh take somebody off this to put them on that or right. the time to go out and pull my tools off this site to go work on it. So it's a it's a battle, and I could assume a property management company would be fighting that battle as well. Hard to find good people. It is. And, uh, you know, they. It, it seems like a lot of people on that end, a lot of the contractors that I work with, and still work with there. Everybody's always talking about doing a hitting a home run on whatever project. You know, we've got three flips going right now, and this guy he's like, "Well, I'm not making any money on this one, but I'm gonna make some money on the next one." I'm like, it's you're you're making money. your base hit. We've got three base hits mm -hmm. right here. You know, it's not like you got to knock a home run every time. The next house yeah. might be. You know, you will right. get the whole job. So but. that's that's actually a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up. In business, the people who are steadily looking for that home run are not going to have the long-term service that you're looking for. They're going to end up having to cut corners at some point because they've overextended in an area. But it's those people you want to align yourself with that believe in that base hit. Let's do a good job. Let's do it right for a fair price. Those are the people over the long haul that tend to end up on top of the mountain right? Uh, looking down at everybody else that was you know, going for that home run. Yeah, it's the people that work through hunting season, the people that work through between if you're you you do it. I see you out hustling on uh, between, you know, November, uh, the end of November to Christmas. You're still out working. Sure. It's base hits. I mean, you my get, family needs it. I mean, yeah. it's we're not looking for home uh, runs. Uh, yeah. We're not looking for home runs. And if a home run happens while you're trying to get a base hit, that's just laying yeah. I right. mean, it's just it's great. And it's yeah. going to happen sometimes. But if you're out looking for that base hit on, on a daily basis, you're going to end up on top. Right. Every, it's a consistency. It really is. We did a flip. We've done the, the two lowest, uh, you know, profit houses we've done have been right down the street from my house. Because um, it's super easy to go deal with it. You know, I just drive up there with my coffee. And then, okay. Yeah. Nope. Y'all got it. Okay. We're not done yet. And, uh, you know, and leave and, you know, we, it is a little discouraging because we don't make as much on those, but I, I would rather you know, do those and control it and control the neighborhood. And it's a good base hit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like it's a, a great deal for any of us, but, uh, you know, we're up in the value in our neighborhood. So I want to make a point on that. Um, so there's two people. There's probably more, but two that stand out the most to me, and it's two different neighborhoods, but it's the same idea. Clay Nelson yeah. and uh, his wife in that neighborhood, I mean, he's the only builder in that neighborhood. He'll build a house, stay in it for two years, and yeah. he sells it, builds another one in there. But it's that, it's that consistency that's out there. Yeah. Well, you did something a little different. You started out in an aging neighborhood, and if you took the neighborhood that you're in right now and looked at similar neighborhoods, which are really close around you, it's completely different. You guys have really invested. The The neighbors that live in that neighborhood need to be sending you a con pie <laughs> for Christmas because 
I mean, truly, you guys have up the values in that neighborhood that uh, even though it's what do you think the average age, maybe 50 years old in that neighborhood home? Oh, yeah. Um, when you look at, in which I'm not just a price per square foot person, but when you're kind of averaging things out, looking at the sales price in that neighborhood for similar aged homes, I mean, I try to go to your neighborhood first when I'm trying to pull comps because right. you guys have done a great job, but y'all are very strategic about that too. Uh, I would, I haven't seen your inside of your personal home, but I would assume you invested in your home to make the things nice the way you want them. Right. And the only way you're going to get that money back is if you continue investing in the other homes that are in that neighborhood. For sure. So it does look great. And, and I mean, it's uh, well, very you. apparent when you walk out there or I don't walk your neighborhood, drive through your neighborhood <laughs> right. or pull comps. It's very apparent what you guys yeah. have done. Oh, wow. <clears throat> well, that's good to hear. Thank you. It is. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about um, the Nila Landlord Facebook group that I think, was it you that started that? Yeah. Yeah. We, how uh, many, how, first of all, how many people are in that group now? I think it's Ballpark. like 1,200 200- 1,200 people. So it might be more. It is active. Very, very active. Yeah. So why did you start that? And I wanted to get, because I needed to know more, you know, and I knew that there was some guys that had been doing a lot longer than me that I might could get them to tell me <laughs> if I had enough people. You know, it started as a, uh, just a, to, to do a meeting, a mm-hmm. RIA, which I didn't know what a RIA was back then, but, um, it was just I had never been to a meeting, but I had heard about that people landlords would meet up and and do that. And uh, so, you know, I really just kind of told a bunch of people, "Hey, get on this group, and we're going to have a meeting." And then, um, shoot, had the first one, had like fifteen people there, and um, me, I started it. David Elahi mm-hmm. uh, that, that passed. He he helped me get it rolling and Nick Ferrara mm-hmm. helped me big time, get it all up and running and, uh, help promote, you know, and get the people there and shoot, man. Now we'll have 60 people in that meeting. Well, one of the things that, uh, take away that I have with it that I really like, you know, when you're in, when you're in business, have a small business, you have to be careful where you take advice from because you'll have people that want to flex and, you know, give half truths or I mean, just inaccurate information. So you want to know where the source is coming from. But since you've had that up and running, the vulnerability of small business owners, just the questions I see people asking um, that some experienced person will say, uh, what, are, what are they talking about? That's what is this? But you don't have people that are just jumping on, trashing people. You have people that are saying, hey, let me help you with this. Right. This is, you know, to them, it may seem like it's like uh, ABCs here, but let me let me hold your hand and walk you through it. So it's been very, very um, uh, welcoming for me to see in the society we live in today that you still have business people w- willing to help other business people to get ahead in life. Um, right. It's a sometimes we we look at and we read the news that it's like uh, everybody's out for themselves. I'm not saying that you don't have people that are still like that, but it is refreshing to see that other people still are willing to help other people if yeah. they're willing to put in the work. For sure, you know we I struggled with it for a little while dealing with some of the takers that would come in to the group, uh, and there's there's takers in every group, mm-hmm. but um, you know I was given so much at the time. And, uh, you know, I don't know who said it, but they were just, Hey, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna do what they're going to do. You just do what you need to do. It's, it's not about what they're going to take, you know, you'll, you'll find out who they are and then you can be done with them. But, uh, and, and, you know, you just don't answer those people's phone call whenever, you know, you, they're just, they're just takers. Yeah. Sometimes I've found that those takers like you change someone's environment, you can change the person and you get the takers around a bunch of givers. Uh-huh. A lot of times those takers end up becoming givers because they see a better way. They see that, well, nobody's trying to get over on me here. Um, I, I'm not going to get taken advantage of. So let me start leaning into it. So yeah. uh, hopefully you've seen some of that oh, man. Th- through the, through the days, but I'm just really I'm impressed with, uh, impressed probably not the right word, it's really good to see the humanity that we have locally. You know, we, uh, like every community, uh, we have things that 
we may not be proud of. Right. But we can choose to focus on that or we can choose to focus on the things that make us great here. And that's what I choose to focus on. That's right. So through that Facebook group, um, you created it to start learning from others and to be a kind of a portal for others to share information. For me, I found some of my best education comes from the failures that right. that I've had. Um, one of the, when I left the nine to five world and went into real estate, which is, you know, like, you know, it's 100% commission, like what you're doing. I mean, if you're not out killing, you ain't eating right. at that point. Um, I found that I work harder for myself than I do for any boss ever, um, but also have made my share of mistakes um, in this business that I'm in. But it's those mistakes that have made me better because I choose to learn from my mistakes so I don't make it again. Right. Talk to me about a l <clears throat> some of the mistakes that you made in the area of real estate investing that make it help someone that's new in this area not to make some of those mistakes. They'll make some other mistakes. But right. Maybe we can prevent some of those. What are what are some of the failures that you've had through this that in hindsight you wish you would have done different and this is kind of what you learned through it? You know, um getting kind of back in myself, I've I've done almost I mean not not everything in real estate, but I've done quite a range from mobile home parks to to houses to fixing up you know, stuff that should have been torn down to, you know, building new construction um, and really getting, getting too stretched out, you know, not, not so much on having so many projects at once, but getting, you know, getting uh, to where cash flow, you, you can't cash flow everything at once. And then, you know, that, that kind of stuff will put you in a hole and it'll, it, you know, not having the money to do X, Y, and Z will really, I mean, it'll make you depressed. I mean, you've been, mm. if you've been flat broke, then you, you know, and I, I put my, I have put myself into that, um, you know, unknowingly, I thought that I had this deal and this deal coming, but, uh, you know, they didn't come that time. Right. And, uh, you know, really got me to look at how prepared I am for, you know, uh, something bad to happen, you know, uh, a not, not bad. Like, um, uh, I guess something big enough that I couldn't come out of, um, w which it might be, it, it would be something that would be slowly, a slow death of, uh, uh in real estate would be, Oh, well you, you have too many projects out paying interest on them. You don't right. have enough cash flow to float all that. And um, being real careful about throttling that, um, and uh, you know, one of the probably one of the biggest mistakes that I've I've done and I've seen people do is letting people that are not in that are not physically doing it tell you how to do it. Yeah. You know, I had some people discouraging me. I mean, people do it all the time, but discouraging me from doing whatever in real estate, buying this track of land, buying this, uh, you know, house to build houses on, uh, and, you know, just ask them what they do. What do, do you do real estate? Yeah. You know, they probably don't, you know, the guys that are, uh, into that business they're they'll just tell you, you know, how to do it. They're not going to tell you don't do yeah, it. They've dealt with it before at that point. And I think that that's really right. important. You got to be careful where you get your information from and who you let into your circle to uh, even comment on the things that, that you're doing. Um, right. On the real estate sales side of it, I see that an awful lot where there's a lot of bad advice that's given that costs a lot of agents a lot of money because they went and paid for this or they haven't gone and did this at that right. point because they're taking advice from people who are not doing what they're doing at that point. I mean, there's Haven't no reason died. for a real estate agent to take advice that's already selling 50 homes a year, take advice someone's only doing 10 a year, right? right. I mean, you, you, you want to look up at people who are actually doing things. It's hard though, because you they like those people. Sure. They look up to them sure. as a, in, you know, as a friend to friend person. Um, you know, buying um 
when I, I went shopping for a real estate agent in Gulf Shores, and the main thing was I was buying it for rental property. And I, it took me a while to find a real estate agent that had multiple rental properties in Gulf Shores. I wanted somebody that that was actually doing it, mm-hmm. you know, not just an agent that sells houses, not right. saying they can't, but I want somebody that knows the numbers. I didn't know anything about that sure. stuff down there. I needed some experience. Totally smart way to look at it. <laughs> I found a guy uh, and, uh, you know, he knew what part of the road goes underwater whenever uh, it rains in Gulf Shores. You know, I mean, this guy knew knew what was going on. Uh, so I think that's that's the biggest thing, though, is finding the people. You know, a title company is an attorney. Mm. You want to look up to them. But he, he's, he's not a property investor. He doesn't have any single right. family houses. You know, you need to talk to that guy. Yeah. And they'll talk to you. But now that you mentioned, uh, you know, your title companies, I feel it's also important that you do surround yourself with a team of professionals that are good at what they do. You don't need your banker telling you title attorney stuff, just like you don't want that title attorney telling you banker stuff. You need right. to find people that are willing to work with you at where you're at and are good at what they do because having relationships, just as a business owner in general, having relationships matter tremendously. Uh, do you find that in, in what you do on a daily basis? For sure. Uh, you know, you, uh, it's the, I saw something the other day is totally true. It's, it's about the people, you know, and guiding you through it. You know, I can't imagine how many people I've had, uh, refer me to the right people uh, and having key people in my life that have said, hey, you know, you need to talk to this guy or this guy's done this before. Go ask him who he uses. Sure. You know, that's the um, I think that's one of the most important things. Advice that you would give someone that is like, I really want to do this, but I just don't know where to start. I want to I want to invest. I want to buy my first house, but I, I just don't know where to start. What advice would you give that person? Go go find a find a deal. Find a house. Tell people you're looking for houses and 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 buy it. You know, it, just take the first step. It's just take it take action. If you find a deal, try, negotiate a price, send an offer, get with a realtor and start, you know. Uh, it's just take a step. I think it's also important for uh, an investor that's just starting out to understand that What is a good investment for Scooter may not be the best investment for this person. Um, I always tell investors that I need to understand what what are your goals? What do you want to achieve here? Are you looking for quick cash flow right now? You just want a place to to stick your money to where it's going to do better than the stock market and you're not planning on cashing anything out, you know, for 20 years. I think it's them understanding what their goals are for investing first. But like you said, I, you have to go do it. You can't. Right. If you let fear drive your decisions, I don't think it's going to be easy to get out of starting gate. Right. There's so many podcasts out there that talk about it in books. Um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly on Audible. I've got a wish list that's too many books that I'll ever listen to, you know, more books than I'll ever listen to. And, um, you know, you can you can pretty much find out word for word what you need to do to to get a deal done. And then talking to people that are experienced, people ask me this all the time. What how do I find a house? How do I do a deal? And I just tell them, just go on Zillow, find you a house and send it to me and we can do the numbers together. Yeah. Probably three times a month. People ask me that once a week. And you know how many deals I get sent to me? <laughs> like maybe one, you know, and they're, they'll they'll send it to me. And I mean, I'll work with the numbers. I'll, I'll tell them what the deal is with it, uh, what I think about it. And then I'll tell them to go ask somebody else. Um, but, uh, you know, most people don't. They, they think they want to do it because they see me, you know, getting to pick up my kids or getting to go do But it requires whatever. work. It's not as... Um... I have not met any investor that um, that started from one, just didn't have an inheritance 
hand it over to them. Right. Any investor that grew their business, I've never met one that uh, did not have to put the work in to get it to that point. Right. It, it, if if it's going to be good and it's worth having, it's going to require some work on some level. Sure. Now, you may get to that point early on where you can leverage and have others do that work. Hooray for you. But for most people, it's not going to work out that way. You're going to have to put the work in until you get to a certain point. Right. Is that a pretty fair statement? For sure. You know, I could, uh, I have friends that tell me I, do, I shouldn't be doing what I do now. I mean, I don't know if you saw, but I got, I got, I got mud up to here <laughs> on my boots today. You know, I, uh, just come out but, of a hole. I literally did. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy doing this stuff and I like working with the people, um, most of them, but uh, I, I really, you know, I like being in the trenches, in, in the ditches and, you know, I'll, I'll, I go visit most all my projects, you know, at least once a day. And then I've got a property manager that she does stuff and I don't even know, you know, what she's doing all the time. She'll, she'll get a house rehabbed and put back up and I won't know about it. I'll just see the well, bill. I mean, you get to a certain point, you have to, you have to leverage and you right. have to have people in place that can allow you to grow because there's only so many hours in a day that, that right. you can actually get involved. Something else that you hit on that I think is important and people really need to uh, take take it as a takeaway, and that's education. Well, yeah. uh, I know that you neither I came from some four-year highly educated <laughs> place, um, and a lot of the um, um, knowledge that we have is through doing and actually honing our craft constantly and, you know, been doing this for 18 years and I'm still learning. The day I stop learning is the day I'm going to be left behind. Right. So it sounds like you believe in that philosophy too. For sure. And, um, I, I'm going to a conference next week. Um, going to, I'm sending, I've sent my property manager to Mr. Landlord conference for the last three years and she's going to go, uh, this summer too. Um, I've been two years in a row. Um, it's a, you know, it's a constant. And then, I mean, podcasts, books, you know, talking to people every day. I mean, we got to we gotta keep that stuff coming. Or you'll get left behind. You'll get left behind, yeah. So at what point, um, so I know that you and Kelsey have been married for, what, about six years? Right. At what point through this growth process did she come into the picture? Uh, well, we, uh, we worked together. Uh, at Powerhouse, and she she had bought a, a trailer and flipped it in that time, and so I was I was over there. You know, we were dating, and I'd help her help her. Well, we actually painted the countertops. It's like this is not gonna work. <laughs> She's like, yep. She I sold it. Yeah, right? that's right. Uh, but she did. She painted the countertops, and we, um, you know, it was the craziest thing. But uh, did it? She sold it. You know, and flipped it, and she's doing it with this trailer she had been doing. She had done that one it was her first, and then she had bought another one, found another one, bought it, did it, and then, um, you know, she probably made as much on that little trailer deal as we did on our last flip, and had a whole lot less money out. <laughs> you know, uh, so I think I might have messed things up for her. She she does it a lot better than I do. <laughs> Well, you could tell that um, I would have to assume that that's some of her style that I see in your flip homes uh, when they hit the market. Dude, that's all her. Um, she's she's got a great style about it, and your homes look really well when you uh, when they do hit the market. Well, thank you. Um, how has um, so you guys have um, four kids? Mm -hmm. um, how has family? How has family changed your your growth dynamic? How has family impacted um, the way you look at business? Completely, one hundred and eighty degrees, the other Tell direction. Me about that. I mean, there's, uh, you know, after you realize that there, we only get them for, you know, very few summers or very, very small amounts of uh, time that they're not in school or we're not having to go do something to provide. But, um, you know, once they got 
into the picture, our two, which she she came with uh, with Bruin, and then which I'd known him for before that since he was you know a year old or less, and then um, you know once we had Lakin or before we had Lakin, once I knew that I, we were going to have another one, um, you know it's kind of okay we're I, we need to full stop. And, um, we I pretty much did like we halted a whole lot of stuff. You know, that was the year sold property management company, uh, so got, um, got out of that, got, you know, smarter with what I was doing with my properties. I sold, uh, quite a few properties, paid off my other properties. I, I was bumping like 175 units, just my personal stuff at mm. one point. And, why why uh, did you sell those properties off? Is it to kind of hone you back into your sweet spot or? Uh, so I could manage them with one person, two people, you know, a handful versus a whole team. Um, and I was able to pay off. I really had the same cash flow with those, you know, that I do now. So, because I was able to pay off a bunch of debt, right. lower my expenses, and I didn't have to deal with uh, those properties anymore. So, you know, it, it was really a, a win-win at the time. Um, and, you know, you think about it, we get, which you've thought about it, you get six, eight yeah. summers with a kid that you can actually do something. Because you can't really do a whole lot while they're from four, but from four to 14, I think. I don't have any that are that old, but they're getting there. Yeah. And they're already not interested. You know, my kids are, would rather play Fortnite than talk to me. I got 11 year olds. So I mean, I, I feel you. I mean, it's like I feel like we're, we're going to make that move to middle school next year and with my, my 10 year old. And it's like, holy crap, the time. Yeah. And she's like, she's growing on 18 and she's uh, only 10. But yeah. But family, um, Definitely has a big impact on my business. Um, but your world ended up getting kind of shaken up a little bit when you had another situation happen. Yeah. So tell me about that. We had some kids. Uh, had some kids dropped off for a little while. Um, well, it's uh, it's going to be hard to talk about it without getting emotional because it's so, uh, you know, it, it's none of us. There was no way that any of us could plan that out it was literally god's hand every step of the way um kids came over you know slay that worked for us asked if we could uh watch some kids at our house that she was already watching for someone else right that she had um you know they had been it was it was really terrible but um they were getting evicted cps got called the kids, uh, they, they, you know, had to leave this apartment that they were, their parents were, um, squatting at. And, um, so they go to her house. She doesn't even have running water at the time. Um, we didn't know that, but she just asked, Hey, can I bring these kids over? Here's our ages and play with your kids for the weekend or just tonight till we figure out what's going on. Um, so, of course, you know, we got kids stuff. We're home on the weekend, this weekend. You know, yeah, bring them over. So weekend, uh, so Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Monday, it was like, okay, well, you know, what do we do? It would just happened to be on some break. I guess it was spring break. And uh, Monday came around. Nobody was going to pick them up yet. No other family had popped up to say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll take them. Um, we're like, well, that's fine. They can stay here. You know, they're, they're great. You know, they're just kids. So they stay, um, you know, pretty much two weeks in, we said, okay, well, we're just going to make them feel like home. You know, no matter if they stay an extra week or uh, – you know, extra, extra day, you know, whatever, we're going to get them set up. So, um, we go and just, it was like, it was so 
there's no way to explain it. We, me and Kelsey had this private conversation. The next few hours, somebody said, hey, I've got this boy bed at my house that I'm getting rid of. Do, y- do y'all want it? I mean, there was no way. She didn't post on Facebook, hey, we're looking for a bed. Um, she didn't, nothing. It was like once we said yes, it, it just showed up. And it literally showed up. It was next door. I walked next door and got this bed and put it in my son's room. And it fit under his big loft bed. I was thinking, oh, this thing ain't going to fit. We're just going to, you know, get him some mattress and wow. stick it down. It was a boy bed. Um, you know, they, they hadn't, they'd been sleeping on couches. They didn't really have a bed at the house that they were at. So you think about if you didn't have a bed, how you, how it would be. We're like, okay, well. How old were these kids at the time? Seven and six. Hmm. So then next neighbor literally three houses down. I backed my truck up down the road into their driveway. She had, she had called, said, Hey, I have this girl bed. Do you want this bed? It might be broken. You know, you, it probably won't take much. I went down there and got it. I was like, Kelsey, this thing's not going to fit. We don't need to put it in the house. I, I will just go, let's just go find one somewhere else. Just like, just put it in there. It was going into our other, our girl's room. And um, it was literally, you know, God doesn't drink beer, but he said, hold my wine (laughs) and watch this. And I mean, we had these two beds show up. I put that bed in there. It fit within inches. Uh, I can't, uh, I mean, it's a huge sleigh bed and we already had a bed in this room and we live you know where we live, you know, it's not like those houses that have huge bedrooms, right. but, uh, you know, he made a way, made a way, man. And you know, those beds might not be, it's just how they just showed up, Brian. They just, Oh, here they are. And then, you know, we're rocking along. We got, uh, our, we had to get CPS mm-hmm. certified to be a foster home so we could, keep them um finally you know a couple weeks in we got a uh, caseworker and then got a casa worker and then got therapist and then got all the the i mean we still had a investigator coming in six months after having them and you're familiar with the system Mm -hmm. it is a full-time job just to keep these kids schedule it is it's crazy yes yeah uh luckily kelsey took over all that I didn't you know I just got the text hey somebody's gonna be in the house (laughs) and it was literally like every other day we had somebody at the house doing something some caseworker somebody that's gotta talk to them about something um and uh it's not a well-oiled machine you know I've uh, been able to see you know the behind the curtain of of the deficiencies we have in Northeast Louisiana, when it comes to the state taking care of the least of these. And I don't exactly know where the fix needs to come in at, right? but it is a broken system. We've got two innocent kids in this case that um, did not cause their situation, and we've got a government entity that's not making their situation any easier yeah. through that process. Um, so... At this point, CPS is involved. Did the parents want to work their case plan to try to make it happen, or were they just okay surrendering rights? Uh, well, they weren't okay with it, but um, we, you know, we were the best fit, um, and we ended up, you know, getting full custody, uh, and 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 well, we were able to to get them without. Uh, I guess having to wait a whole long time because the parents did surrender and then they, they, uh, the dad actually, I've never met the guy, but, and he did live local back then. Um, but, uh, he was, you know, just no, no contact for the lap forever. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty terrible situation. 
the other scary part about that is you've got two older kids, um, um, a boy and a girl, correct? Right. The likelihood that had you guys not been available, the likelihood that they'd have been able to keep those two together was very, very slim, I can tell you, um, right. if they had to put them someplace else. And that just breaks my heart, you know, mm. not only these kids um, losing their mom, which I'm sure they probably would have went back to no matter the living conditions because right. it's mom. It's it's all I know. It's right. I mean, I want to be with mom, but I don't know. It's just a bad situation. And I'm so thankful you guys were there willing to go through it and put your yes on the table to make that happen. Um, you know, we kept saying yes, um, and we had no idea how it's going to happen. And, and having people that would discourage you from mm. doing that, um, I mean, it's, 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 it is hard to think about whenever I think back, oh, what, what, how did we know that we could do it? You know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta pay for them. You gotta feed them. They're not free. They got ball. They have gymnastics. They have dance. They have school things. Um, <laughs> they got. You know, they got, a uh, they got all the things that our kids have. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but you know, one of the things that keeps popping up that people tell me, well, I don't know, I would, but I don't know that we could afford it again. I mean, looking back now, we didn't know how much it cost or what, you know, they would, <laughs> the state doesn't pay for, they barely pay for gymnastics. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, the, you know, what, what would it cost? What would I tell my kids if I didn't do that? Yeah. So what, how am I being an example for them to follow? Right. Yeah. What would I, I mean, if they ask me, well, why didn't we keep them one day? Why didn't we, I mean, it's, it's so sad. It's like something that's disposable to people. Yes. It's just like that. You can go and look on the pound website. Mm-hmm. It's, on the LDF, they have a Louisiana Heart Gallery, and it's the saddest thing ever. And you can, I mean, it's, you know, you look at it, and it's like, oh, my gosh, people think that this is disposable. You know, they're just going to sit there and wait. And the older the kid gets, the harder it is to place that kid in the home. Yeah. Harder. Everybody wants a baby. <laughs> Everybody wants a baby. But it gets so hard. So I'm thankful you guys were there. And, you know, as a believer in Christ, you know, we're called to um, – to take care of the widows and the orphans. And for those that may listen to this and say, well, I just don't know how I can afford it. What I have to say too is you put your yes on the table and let him show you how you can afford it. That's all you got to do is just step up to the plate. Right. Put your yes on the table. We have such a, uh, uh, an overflow of kids in the system in our community. It's really sad. It, um, breaks my heart to know that we have so many kids that are in the system and you guys didn't intentionally go out looking right. to be able to foster, but the need for foster parents is great. The need for, um, CASA workers. Um, and for those that don't know, a CASA is basically a fo- as a foster parent, you can't advocate in court for that child. You can't really say a whole lot to the judge, but that CASA worker is the voice of that child in court to be able to, to look out for what's, in that child's best interest and there's value in that. So, you know, that's a funny point talking about Jesus made a way. Um, every time we went to court for our kids, they told us, well, you can come, but you really just be sitting there. Yeah. I'm sure you've been, you'll just be sitting there. There's, you know, you can come or you don't have to, if you got to work, it's okay. You know, Kelsey went every time and, Maybe it's because he knew my wife because she's been in court uh, doing, you know, with our rental property, Mm -hmm. doing eviction court. And she, you know, has seen the judge has seen her frequently and knows knows me from uh, the business that we've done in in court. Um, Hopefully he doesn't remember me from all my traffic accident, (laughs) traffic tickets. But, uh, you know, she spoke every time they went to court. Well, that's definitely unusual. Is it? It's not. It's not something that that happens often. Yeah, every time. Why would that happen? 
it's because it was out of our hands. It was, you know, I don't get too spiritual because uh, I'm not, you know, I don't know everything that a lot of other people do. But, um, I mean, there is no way the things that have happened since we said, yeah, put our yes on the table, like you said, that you can explain that. You can explain some of the stuff to me uh, away. You know, there's no way. It's Jesus said, you said yes, okay. Hold my wine, watch mm-hmm. this, and here we go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we probably could keep going on for a lot of other different things, but I, I guess is just kind of a, a good spot for us, for me to say, thank you for being a um, a business leader in the community that people can look up to, um, a business leader that can uh, be available to people to uh, – answer their questions or to mentor them. Now I'm sure you're probably a little like me in, in the, the fact that I don't have problem giving you my time, but just don't waste my time. Right. Um, but if someone's truly needing the help or would like to bounce some ideas, you won't have a problem with them reaching out to you. Absolutely not. And, and I would encourage people to join that Facebook group that you have. You do have, anytime you have a meetup, you announce it on there yeah. so people can, um, is it once a month you have a, a meetup? Right, once a month at the end of the month. Um, it's not set in stone. You know, we all have busy lives that are running it. Sure. Um, but it's usually towards the end of the month, and uh, it's usually on Thursday at Catfish Charlie's. And it's just a great way for like-minded people to get together, bounce all ideas off one another, and you're guaranteed to come away with some type of nugget. Uh, but don't just be a taker. Let's right. um, give some information if you have information to be able to give. For sure. Scooter, thank you so much for giving me your time to come yeah, on man. and just share this story. Um, I learned a lot about you today, <laughs> and I, I really appreciate it. I'm honored that you came in to do it, and uh, I can't wait to see, you know, how these kids flourish in the home that you've offered them and what uh, your business is going to look like 10 years from now. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this podcast. We really appreciate your involvement. Please leave us a comment or even better yet, subscribe to this podcast and hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted for every new episode when it hits. 